Great. Good. Hi, everyone. Uh, today, I'll talk about our emulator-based calibration implementation within PCAN. Uh, if you have, haven't heard about PCAN before, it stands for Predictive Ecosystem Analyzer, and it's like a land data assimilation system, maybe with some additional features, which I will talk about uh, in a moment. And even though our emulator approach has been out there for a while now, I will still start with explaining it a little bit because probably not everyone here is familiar with it and also the other topics that I will mention today and also maybe the following discussions uh, would make maybe more sense in the light of uh, like how it actually works. So uh, previous talks today and yesterday have already explained the need for constraining parameter uncertainties of our models. So I will jump right in with the inverse numerical methods such as uh, Markov chain Monte Carlo algorithm MCMC that can do this for us. And you all know how it goes. So in a nutshell, one would uh, propose a parameter vector, run the model, compute the likelihood and the posterior accept reject and repeat this typically like hundreds and thousands of iterations until we obtain this uh, posterior parameter sample that produces model predictions that are more compatible with your observations. So I'm going to call this uh, a brute force MCMC approach. Um, so with this approach, with even with moderate model runtimes, it could easily like take a year to calibrate your model. And it's also not uncommon that these models that we use are prohibitively slow to even plug into these algorithms that require these hundreds of thousands of uh, sequential um, model evaluations. So then there can be different remedies. We have been hearing about these um, uh, parameter data assimilation approaches, uh, different ones, but we turn to model emulation, so or surrogate-based uh, calibration where we uh, emulate the model with a Gaussian process and then throw this faster emulator into the MCMC instead of the full model. So this diagram on the right kind of summarizes the uh, approach, but I will still continue on this figure to contrast it with this brute force approach. So we again start with proposing parameter vectors, but this time we propose multiple ones uh, in parallel. Then we can run our model with each of these parameter vectors again in parallel. Then we can con compare the model outputs to da data streams, calculate the likelihoods, and all these steps can be done in parallel. So uh, the time limiting steps of running the full model and uh, sequentially and also comparing it to the uh, data many times are reduced in this framework. And at the end of these steps, uh, we are left with these design matrices where each row is a different parameter vector together with an associated uh, value of error statistics or goodness of fit statistics. Then uh, we fit our um, statistical emulator on this error surface. And in our case, we um, fitted a Gaussian process model as our emulator because it will always pass through these design points where you run the full model. And also Gaussian processes allow for this uh, estimation of uncertainties uh, associated with the interpolation in between. So once constructed, we throw this emulator into the MCMC where you know, uh, we again propose new parameter vectors and then use the Gaussian process to estimate the error statistics. And then uh, we compute the posterior, um, unnormalized posterior for each proposed uh, vector and yeah, repeat this in the MCMC loop. So in the end, if we think this error surface and the, uh, subsequently the, this parameter, posterior parameter distribution is not well resolved, um, we can repeat and refine our emulator. So in other words, we can add, we can propose uh, additional training points to train our emulator uh, better. So this was actually uh, one of the three important maybe tricks that we uh, did in our implementation. Uh, so the vertical red lines here uh, are the true parameter values that are used in creating a synthetic data set. Then we try to see whether the emulator-based calibration can retrieve those values back. And here I will just point out to this uh, blue posterior and this dashed uh, posterior distribution here. So their emulators were trained with the same number of design points. But for the blue one, uh, the emulator was iteratively refined in a nested or adaptive manner. So each round, new uh, training points were added from the parts of the parameter space that was explored to be more likely by the previous round. And whereas for this dashed one, um, all the design points were proposed at once in the beginning without any iterative refinement of the emulator. So as you can see, um, how big of 
you it, there's a big difference it, it makes that where you propose these uh, training points from so in other words the quality of your design points also matter uh, as much as the quantity and maybe uh, even more then another uh, feature or of our approach was to emulate the likelihood surface so it's also in quite common in the literature to see the people emulating the raw model um, outputs. But we adopted this approach because likelihood surfaces are generally uh, smoother. And also the other advantage of uh, this is that this quantity has already seen the data. So for someone else to rebuild the emulator and repeat the calibration, it is then enough to pass around these parameter vectors and their associated likelihoods, for example. And this is especially handy if like the data are hard to transfer or even not shareable uh, due to privacy reasons. And um, for we took this one step further and uh, for some likelihood functions, we emulated the sufficient statistics surface here denoted with T. Um, sufficient statistics here has a formal mathematical definition which I won't go into, but the advantage of doing this emulating the sufficient statistics surface is that now the statistical parameters of the likelihood, such as the tau, the precision here, can also be fitted in the MCMC simultaneously with the uh, process-based model parameters. Uh, and finally, another trick that was needed uh, to make the emulator-based MCMC work was to modify the algorithm a little bit uh, to accommodate for this interpolation uncertainty in the emulator, because now with the emulator, you have a stochastic model instead of your deterministic uh, process-based model. So you need to make sure uh, you're using an algorithm with proper uh, configurations. So I also tested this emulator-based calibration and brute force MCMC uh, uh, calibration approach against each other using real world data. And it was kind of reassuring to see uh, that the both approaches were finding the same uh, parameter space. Although maybe for the brute force MCMC that uses the full model at every iteration and the posteriors are a better result than the emulator um, calibration. Which I would still argue uh, is probably uh, better than no calibration at all when you have to work with one of these prohibitively uh, slow models. Okay, so Overall, I can say that I found the emulator-based calibration of process-based models effective, but as you can see, there were some tricks to make them work efficiently or sometimes even properly. But the biggest issue for me, and later I found out that like, it's quite common to everyone who is working with the Gaussian processes, is that GPs can also get quite slow with increasing dimensionality. So after a while, the gain you obtain from adding these additional training points can start to heavily trade off with the wall clock time. So Currently, I'm in the uh, lookout for uh, more scalable emulators, which I will come back in the end. Now, um, I have been implementing this emulator approach within PCAN. As I mentioned uh, in the beginning, PCAN is a model data integration cyber infrastructure that can work with multiple lens surface models. So you can uh, couple different models to a PCAN framework. It has this workflow management system and a data assimilation framework. And I won't go into the details of how PCAM works here, but it's open source, all code is on GitHub, and always happy to chat about PCAM. But here the idea is that like experts in this meeting, um, um, who, who are the experts of these computational and statistical methods can implement and generalize these algorithms in such shared community tools so that others can also make use of these methods. And not only, I'm not only talking about non-experts, um, both us experts can also join efforts and eventually maybe uh, focus more on um, progressing on the development of more novel uh, methods. And one other interesting point of implementing these workflows in PCAN uh, was that PCAN communicates to a database as its informatics backend, all in, in the relevant steps of the workflow. And this database is then synced with the other PCAN instances around the world. So when I perform a calibration, um, the workflow automatically inserts my posteriors to the posterior table of this database. And then someone else can, for example, use my posteriors without ha having to repeat the calibration. And similarly, someone who is an expert in running their own model, um, they can work on their own servers and then just sync the database with me so that I can get their model data comparisons and build up on that even without like having to see 
uh, their models or data. So this distributed computing design uh, opens up many possibilities, um, of, but we are hoping that this will especially become handy as we now have pushed this emulator approach into a multi-site hierarchical calibration. And the idea here is that um, with these lens surface models, we have often this, have this question of how to calibrate the model uh, with data that are collected across different sites over different years. For example, the eddy covariance network data sets are such examples. So should you, for example, uh, calibrate your model to each one of these towers individually, or should you uh, calibrate your model against all data jointly? But rather in the continuum between these two extremes, we decided to build a simple hierarchical model where at the site level, we are still fitting the parameters to each site. And then at the hierarchical level, we model these sites to be distributed around a global, uh, across site global mean and variance. So uh, hierarchical calibration or model fitting is quite common in other disciplines, but not so much in the land surface model applications, uh, probably because these models are already quite computationally uh, expensive uh, for these individual uh, simple calibrations. So we again used our uh, emulator approach uh, in this framework. And unfortunately, for the uh, sake of time, I won't be able to go into the technical details here. But there are um, three very helpful results or maybe uses of hierarchical Bayesian calibration. So one, uh, it enables us to have a formal way of making out of sample predictions. So after this hierarchical calibration, when a new prediction is made at one of the sites that went into the calibration, we will use the site level parameters that we have fitted for that site. But when a new prediction will be made at a new site whose data was not used in the uh, calibration, we can use these global parameters, which quantifies the, uh, also propagates the uncertainties associated with the site-to-site -site, uh, variability in model parameters. And um, the second, now we have like a way of partitioning the variability some more, one at the within site level and one at the across site level. So we can now come up with some hypotheses of why these site-to-site -site variabilities could be occurring. So what factors could explain this site-to-site -site variability in the parameter values? Because it probably indicates something missing in the model that the calibration is trying to compensate for by changing these parameter values. So this way, uh, hierarchical calibration can also formally give us a structure that can detect processes that are missing from our models and help us uh, prioritize our development efforts without actually implementing them. So, and the third um, use of hierarchical calibration can be like, now you can also compare this relative importance of within site versus across site variability. So in our case, uh, across site parameter variability was dominating the uncertainties, uh, which further indicates that uh, we should probably invest in doing measurements at more sites rather than measuring the same thing at the same site for longer periods. Um, but I two, two minutes. Got it. Okay. Sorry. But I should probably uh, put a footnote here um, that in this exercise we haven't quantified the temporal variability, so I might be uh, speaking maybe too soon. But overall, the hierarchical Bayesian calibration can also guide our uh, measurement efforts. For example. Uh, to find some optimal places to add new sensors to our existing networks. So uh, I have already mentioned some of the shortcomings that I have experienced so far. For example, as the Gaussian process implementation that I use doesn't scale well, um, I had to target few parameters in the calibration than I would like to. So I had to stick to a certain biome type in the hierarchical multi-site calibration, for example, because more PFTs mean uh, more parameters to calibrate. And um, that in return limited the number of sites that I used in the hierarchical calibration. Um, and it was a pity because um, the information content in this global parameters in the hierarchical calibration were pr primarily controlled by the number of sites that went into the calibration, not by the amount of data that was available within a site. So the idea is now to switch to uh, faster, more scalable emulators, for example, some sparse implementations of Gaussian processes or switching to basis functions or neural networks. Yeah, we will uh, see. And if we can get an emulator that can scale, uh, then we can uh, emulate for the whole globe. 
And once you scale to the whole globe, then you would have more sites. So the distance between those sites would also decrease. Then we would need a more complex hierarchical Bayesian model to better account for the special correlation structure in the parameter variables. We currently are. Um, hierarchical model is quite simple and does not account for such um, information. And um, as I mentioned here, we only considered the special aspect, but uh, a more sophisticated spatiotemporal model could also be developed here, uh, as there are also missing processes in models that would cause these parameters to vary in time. So yesterday, Tris put it very nicely that parameters changing in time are not parameters. You are probably compensating for something. And I think uh, maybe hierarchical Bayesian calibration uh, could be a good way of weeding uh, such things out. So um, yeah, uh, even though this talk barely maybe scratches the surface of the possibilities with the emulators, I hope I was able to give you some examples and some ideas on like how to combine emulators with our process-based or physics-based models. Yeah, with that, I, will, I want to thank you all and I would like to acknowledge my collaborators and funders. Thank you. <laughs>